Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait for a couple of minutes because people are just coming in. Right, um, I'm going to start. Hello and welcome to Internews Earth Journalism Network webinar series. My name is Amy Sim from the Earth Journalism Network Asia Pacific Project. Thank you very much for joining us today. The topic of our discussion today is reporting on riverbank erosion in South Asia. Before I turn over to our speakers, I would like to say a few words about Earth Journalism Network. We are the environmental program of Internews, which is an NGO working to ensure people that have access to trusted, timely and accurate information. At Earth Journalism Network, we work together with our community of more than 12,000 uh, environmental journalists all across the world to improve the quantity and quality of environmental reporting. You can find out more about us uh, on our website, earthjournalism.net. If you like, please sign up, it's free. Um, we post lots of opportunities and grant uh, uh, opportunities for journalists. Very pleased today to co-host um, this webinar together with Oxfam Transboundary Rivers of South Asia Project, or TROSA for short. Oxfam TROSA works to address the underlying causes of poverty and marginalization of the people living in transboundary Ganges, Brahmaputra, Magna River Basin in Nepal, India, Bangladesh, and the Salwin River of Myanmar. TROSA facilitate communities' participation in water governance and help them hold their rights to water through dialogue and policy formulation. For this webinar, we've put together a very exciting panel of speakers. We have a civil engineering professor, a professor of water and flood management, an earth data journalist, uh, sorry, an earth data scientist, and an environmental journalist. However, we are aware that we haven't done a very good job with uh, finding female speakers, and we very much apologize for that, and we will strive to strike a better gender balance in the future. So the four speakers will present for an hour, which will be followed by half an hour of questions and answers. Throughout the webinar, you can send in your questions. We ask that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please put down your name and the country you're from along with your questions. We will collect your questions and address them at uh, the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over to my colleague Ramesh Bushal to introduce our speakers. Ramesh is a seasoned environmental journalist and is our South Asia content coordinator. Over to you, Ramesh. Thank you, Amy. As you said, um, rivers are very important to this region. Um, you know, the Hindu Kushimala region we call, uh, it expands from Afghanistan to uh, Myanmar in the east about 3,500 kilometers of this uh, mountains, support the life of about 2 billion people downstream. It is a pretty important issue in, in the region. Um, uh, for example, if you talk about this um, Brahmaputra, Meghna, and the Ganges Basin, about 750 million people uh, depend on food, energy, and all their livelihood options. So um, riverbank erosion is uh, pretty much a kind of an issue that needs to be talked about. So it hasn't got um, a kind of a profile it has to, uh, but you know I think uh, this this webinar will help uh, to you know profile it in a better way. Um, uh, in this in this webinar, we will explore um, the science behind the um, the river bank erosion in the region, the underlying social and political issues uh, influencing this management, and also cite some examples of um, uh, this uh, river bank erosion in South Asia, and also find ways to uh, draw on satellite images and data to enhance um, reporting on this topic. So we have uh, four speakers, as you mentioned, um, pretty um, uh, well-known speakers uh, in their sectors. Uh, we have um, Chandan Mahanta. Dr. Chandan Mahanta is a, currently a professor and head uh, in the civil engineering department in Indian Institute of uh, Technology in Guwahati in Northeast India. Professor Mahanta has served in uh, various national and international committees uh, including in the uh, working groups in the Planning Commission of India. Uh, second one, um, Dr. Mohammad Mansoor Rahman. He is currently a professor uh, at the Institute of Water and Flood Management. 
uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, he has conducted research on morphological processes in tidal and non-tidal uh, rivers, growth of char land resources, and livelihood uh, strategies, uh, river erosion protection, and social response. Third, we have Edward Boyda. He is the lead scientist um, at Earthrise Media, where he runs um, satellite-based investigations for environmental and um, human rights reporting. Uh, previously, he was associate professor of physics at St. Mary's College of California and a NASA researcher. Last but not least, we have Naveen Singh Kharga. He is an environment correspondent with BBC World Service. He reports for the BBC's TV, radio, and online, uh, reaching to tens of millions of audiences across the globe. Water issues in South Asia are one of the topics he has focused on um, you know, over the years to cover, particularly um, in the context of climate change. So we are happy to have you all uh, on board. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will uh, start with um, Professor Mahanta. Uh, Dr. Mahanta, the floor is yours now. No. Am I audible to all? Yes, I can hear you. Am I audible to all? Uh, that says a uh, little. Uh, just uh, there is an echo. There is an echo. Yeah. That's right. Uh, let me see. Dr. Mahanta, can you speak again? Yes, uh, just hold on. You can unmute your microphone. Your microphone is muted. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible now. Yes, Professor. Yes, please. Yes, very well. Am I audible now? Yes, uh, I'm slightly inconvenienced in a different location than my office. So uh, there may be a bit of problem on the audio part. Kindly bear with me and uh, tell me when you uh, miss me for some reason. Um, Welcome all. I'll not really uh, spend time on the formalities. Uh, I have very eminent co-panelists. I'm sure we all uh, will uh, highlight a few different facets and aspects of the erosion, uh, particular river erosion problem of uh, Asia in particular. Uh, here I thought because the uh, perspective is from journalism and also there is an environmental dimension. So I sort of shifted from the conventional uh, engineering that we do for riverbank erosion. Right now, uh, I have my co-panelist, uh, Professor Mansoor, also from Bangladesh. I'm sure he will highlight a uh, couple of experiences in the Bangladesh part. Uh, characteristically, this is the same river, but there are very clear three uh, dimension. One is the Himalayan part of the river, uh, Brahmaputra, when we talk about this particular uh, Jango, Yarlung, and Brahmaputra, and then finally Padma. Uh, but the problem is similar. Uh, you can see this first slide where the red patches are primarily showing the uh, landslide areas of the, this particular region, including extending to almost to the Japanese side. Uh, so you realize that all these sediments are generated uh, in these particular hills due to large landslides. Some of them are hundreds of meters wide. And all these materials keep coming down. Uh, those of you who perhaps may be aware about the formation of the Himalayas, that there were tectonics it, movement, it, so there are a lot of uprise of this material, and uh, which were the, you see, skin share. Skin, skin share. Can you steer the slides, please? Yes. Yeah, please. Can you slide uh, start the? Uh, start is it visible? The, the slide is visible. No. Not yet. The slides are not visible. No. 
No, no. Oh. Where am I? But <coughs> I already shared all oh, the share screen at the beginning. Wow. Yes. yes, perfect, perfect. Now it's visible. Yes, please go ahead. You can see that. All right. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, is the slide moving now? Not, not as of now. Um, you put it on slideshow. Can you see the slides? Now it's okay. Good now. Is the slides yeah, moving? No, no. Yeah. Now it's yes. Okay. Now it's good. Yes, please. Can Go you ahead. see the second slide? Can you see the second slide? Yes. 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 yes we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, primarily, I'll talk about uh, you know some of the community-based effort in terms of erosion control, where uh, there are. Uh, focus effort on something uh, that is evolving more and more called bioengineering. And here uh, we are looking at a situation where um, apart from this large engagement that you are having in terms of uh, erosion control uh, from a you know, bigger project perspective, there are a lot of patches where uh, this is not affordable or it's not working. So as a result, uh, we have this combined problem here in this part of the world. Uh, one is the flooding problem, and I'm just showing a slide uh, where you can see the uh, quite well known the Kajiranga National Park where uh, flooding creates a problem, and then there is uh, uh, the sliding of the bank where you know the park is losing a, a huge amount of land over the years. So. Uh, Typically, if you look at the mid part of the Brahmaputra, that is the Jango Yalum, the Tibetan part, uh, we have uh, papers showing that most of the sediments actually get generated uh, just from about 5% of the total catchment area because there are some locations which are extremely uh, you know, weak rock and friable material along with uh, many of you may be aware that this is one of the highest uh, rainfall uh, part of the world. So all these materials do come down and it creates the entire different kind of morphology leading to, as you can see in this particular slide, a lot of braiding of the river. It's not a single channel, it's really multiple channel. And each of these channel uh, act as a uh, kind of a semi river. And it has its uh, own problem of you know, migration and river migration. And eventually they, they, they create a lot of problem in the bank. Uh, these materials being very, very weak material, they get uh, eroded, they get again uh, resuspended, they get redeposited. So it makes the river a very dynamic river and the entire uh, process of building and uh, you know, destruction continue. And that in a way uh, facilitate the flood problem uh, because the, most of the time the embankments are generally made out of uh, the materials. And even when we are using some of these new technology relatively uh, what is known as uh, geotubes and geodikes. Uh, we use a lot of geotextiles now because slowly our uh, original uh, engagement in terms of uh, boulder spar, in terms of uh, you know, other sort of uh, natural material have run out. So right now we are having uh, this uh, huge problem of material supply. And as a result, if you see that uh, um, some of these typical problems are uh, facing the society enormously in terms of breach of embankment because these are mostly uh, made of uh, impervious core of the material that is uh, generally provided by the same sediment brought down by the river. And at the same time, uh, you know, there may be also sometimes intervention from the human side. There are multiple reasons. Uh, right now, I'll not really go into that. So typically, there is a whole lot of what is called as a geotechnical instability, and most of the time, the river bank actually work as a uh, kind of unstable slope, and that uh, creates uh, this uh, uh, differential, uh, you know, erosion problem, 
and creating a whole uh, dynamic landscape uh, which makes uh, very difficult for people to really have a stable living on the on the river bank the the cost is enormous and uh, the the people suffering is also in a uh, in a sort of a very very uh, even scale so as a result of that uh, some of our very um, structural intervention have been in terms of uh, you know structures like the geotubes where you use geotextile tubes fill in with the same uh, material that is brought down by the river and uh, more or less they're working but they're very expensive uh, so you can see some pictures where we are actually using large geo bags or geo tubes filled with the same uh, sediment material that is coming along the river and filled in these bags actually act as a very good uh, deterrence for uh, both uh, in terms of flood protection as well as also the bank erosion but uh, as i said they're very expensive you can see that uh, this is one section of geo tube uh, covered with geo mats and finally uh, you know uh, covered with a bit of vegetative cover uh, they are very good uh, wherever they are being applied they are holding fairly well and you can see also that uh, we are actually laying, laying down the geomatrix on the river and then kind of uh, you know trying to vegetate the cover so that it become a permanent uh, structure uh, of, of a very good consolidated kind however um, these materials are very expensive even a spar of this kind where a lot of boulders were being used uh, which is slowly getting running out and we do not have good quality boulders anymore uh, they cost in uh, indian currency about uh, you know about uh, uh, 100 million rupees and that's kind of uh, again a very very prohibitive structure so uh, while we are using some of these technologies called the uh, rcc porcupines very effectively at places their performance also have been differential. This is a very interesting uh, uh, engagement that our flood control department is engaging up in, where uh, we create screens and screens of these porcupines, the concrete porcupines. It creates a kind of energy dissipation uh, in the river, the velocity gets reduced, and it you know, leads to the uh, deposition and precipitation of the sediment brought by the river. So the sediment itself can start prograding and building up the bank instead of eroding. So in the process, we, we gain land rather than losing land. This is one of the very, very common practice right now happening here. But uh, we again have to, uh, faced you know, differential uh, performance based on the kind of trust of the river, the velocity of the water. We have seen that uh, in many cases uh, where the velocity is more than uh, three meter per second or more than that, uh, that the porcupine screen uh, do not hold on for many, many years. And, uh, maintenance and you know sustainability becomes an issue. So I'm just coming to the, my main focus here in this short presentation that while we have a typical technology in the river part, as you can see in this sketch in terms of you know boulder pitching and there's the apron at the bottom, and then also we have a mechanism of you know uh, holding the toe there with a toe key. Uh, this fairly works well for wherever we have the the uh, bay, bay flow and, and, and the river water. However, in the long run, uh, one is that we are running out of boulders. Secondly, we are also having uh, some of short supply of geotextile and geo bags. So we are now looking for you know, simple, cost-effective, and environmental friendly solution, which can be given to the community. And uh, with some amount of training and workmanship, uh, this can perhaps work well. So here is a case where we are looking at, uh, you know, uh, the, the rational of sustainable solution where we're talking about i'll not really go through the entire uh, text here the nature-based solution and they're gaining good ground at the community level where uh, use of indigenous material uh, along with some of the vegetative cover and particularly you know grasses like uh, vetiver and some of the raw large root grasses are holding fairly well so while our effort for large-scale intervention in terms of uh, precast concrete slab in terms of boulder pitching and boulder, um, you know, engagement is there. But uh, slowly uh, we are kind of breaking this problem into smaller part. And at many lo locations we are actually going for uh, what is biodegradable and material like vetiver, bamboo, and all these other kind of different vegetative uh, species where we have a deeper root structure. I must say that these are not fully effective for very high velocity situation. 
So most of the time we go for a hybridization where do we have hardcore engineering practice, but we try to supplement this uh, in a, from an ecological perspective to uh, kind of make amendment that in the most uh, vulnerable part, we go for the hardcore engineering structure, but we try to build up over a period of time, the sustainable part through this. One of the logic or one of the you know, uh, argument or uh, kind of a reason that we have is that uh, the civil engineering structure that we generally have, whether it is a geobag, the report that many of the geotextile over a couple of years of exposure to ultraviolet radiation start tearing apart and there is a problem. Uh, but most of the bioengineering material over a period of time of say in this case about 25 years, they relatively gain strength and they wherever they hold on, uh, they become a good permanent solution. On the other hand, there is a sort of a overall uh, decay of some of the civil engineering uh, you know, engagement where we have a lot of money to be spent on the maintenance part. So here is a case in point where the bioengineering wherever possible in terms of economy or environmental compatibility, uh, maintenance and improve strength over time. Uh, these are some of the advantages of the uh, bioengineering applications. Although again, I'll maintain that they are never being a substitute for hardcore engineering, which uh, have been practiced uh, still, but they are large investment, big money, and also, you know, uh, kind of a robust structure. But these are like community-based solution where people can work on uh, indigenous material. So there are of course limitations of installation season and availability of the kind of plant material, also labor consideration, the kind of training and time of installation, etc. But over a period of time, uh, we are slowly realizing that when fund is a limitation, where community involvement is possible, where labor is available, indigenous material is available, uh, we can use uh, stuff like bamboo fencing and all, and altogether they work fairly well. Vetiver is just one example where you can see some of these root structure to be really, really very, very, uh, you know, um, the network is robust and very big. And you can see that if it is allowed to grow over a long period of time, uh, different species can work differently. There are a lot of examples where use of vetiver has been happening over uh, many countries of Asia. Uh, you can see that there are also some supplementary uh, engagement in terms of brush layering, where again, we use the layer of plant material intercepted between layer of soil. Uh, again, I must say that these are not entirely foolproof for all kinds of situation, uh, but they are holding good, as you can see, uh, many of these, uh, the end of this is happening. This is, I would say, more emerging. Uh, maybe last about two decades we have started. We are uh, many times working them on the laboratory in terms of their tensile strength in particular. Uh, so those uh, scientific and the engineering part of it has to be done. But uh, many countries in the Asia now is kind of uh, working on this mattress and uh, other kind of bamboo mat. Uh, this is an example from 2002 to 2005, over three years, how uh, in Mekong uh, we have uh, you know, got a very good a result here in this particular stretch of the river. Uh, similarly, you'll see there are examples from China uh, where this is a very recent paper in 2020. Uh, and you can see the cross section of the experimental area. As you can see, it's still an experimental one and it needs time and engagement. But these are very promising uh, technology, I would say, uh, with low cost, uh, community engagement, indigenous material, and stuff like that. So. Slowly, apart from the larger support from the water resource and the department concern, uh, we are actually trying to look at some of this uh, bioengineering stuff. There are many of case studies available. Uh, today, with the very limited time, it will not be possible to really throw light on all of them. But you can see that here, uh, we are handling the problem, both from a, a hydrological point of view, hydraulics point of view, as well as also from a geotechnical engineering point of view. So there are plenty of uh, literature available here. Many people are now kind of trying, uh, doing this. Uh, there are many engagement from several countries of Asia. And uh, you can see that how even Nepal, there's very interesting engagement in terms of uh, utilization of local bamboo here, uh, building a sort of retaining structure, uh, along with masonry, concrete, and other Gabion uh, structures. And it's fairly holding good. Uh, there are, again, uh, you know, it's sort of an experimental part, but the report has been that the experimental results have been very promising, and uh, it is people's technology, 
which perhaps can be decentralized into you know, villages and communities of many parts of Asia where uh, this can work pretty well. So um, there are examples, of course, that you, you don't see really very exotic pictures here, like typical engineering structure, but uh, there are differential uh, you know, performances also. Uh, there have been already also endorsement by World Bank to help out some of this uh, erosion and water run infiltration problem from the 80s onwards. Uh, in Thailand, the capability of the routes have been worked on. In fact, it is being tried also for cracking down some of the hard pan soil to make this soil amenable for agriculture. Almost about a dozen experimental centers in Thailand have been experimenting on uh, vetiver's capability to break down the hard pen soil and you know, growing a uh, different kind of agricultural products there. Similarly, you, this is a very interesting example in the Liaohe River in the Northeast China, where uh, over a differential engagement, uh, there are many gains at different level and at, uh, you know, the slope, uh, slope soil stability and anti erodibility uh, apparently have gone up in about four years time of this particular experiment. So you can see the landscaping quality before and after the nature-based uh, bioengineering technique. And probably uh, we like it or not uh, with the kind of fun crunch and the kind of enormity of the problem, at least if not a foolproof technology, uh, this is bioengineering is going to be a, a good supplementary technology. So within a limited time, I just thought of kind of highlighting that Probably from a reporting perspective, some of these uh, promising engagement can be looked into, can be reported, and uh, you know the experiment and the successful stories can be kind of uh, spread about to other people to to kind of uh, you know em emulate. So it has been seen that uh, uh, there are a large degree of uncertainty, of course, because of the nature of variability of rainfall uh, and also that kind of behavior of the erosion. Many times, uh, these materials uh, being on a uh, seismic terrain, uh, one of the basic problem where we look at it is a zone five uh, earthquake zone, uh, where uh, the stemmers are a very constant phenomena and the river keep adjusting to that. So most of our solutions become transient because of this, uh, you know, tremor-based intervention and earthquake intervention. So uh, there is a need of uh, readjusting to the situation every time. And uh, typically uh, one has to look at pre-erosion mitigation and a preventive management, then, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, firefighting. In uh, our engagement so far in terms of a large scale in Majuli and some of the largest river island have been fairly okay with geotextile, geobags and uh, geotubes, but uh, that being very costly, uh, perhaps it is time that local material as bioengineering solution uh, can be experimented on, can be looked into how the indigenous community material can be uh, you know, used for uh, also their easy maintenance in future, uh, which does not require too much. Uh, Nature-based solution, uh, perhaps from an environmental perspective, ecological engineering perspective, uh, making more and more sense. Uh, also, there is a recyclability and reusability issue there. Many of our uh, porcupines, once they get to the main river, uh, create other sort of problem and havocs. Uh, so this is something that uh, I'm sure uh, one can look into as a future uh, sustainable uh, solution or at least part of the solution of uh, river bank erosion. So I'll stop here. Um, and of course, uh, if at all there is any specific questions later on, uh, I'll get back there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Mohanta. It was um, very insightful. Uh, the bioengineering is going to be um, one of the major um, solution. And also you said hybridization of the engineering science and the, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the uh, new uh, nature-based solutions uh, will be really helpful. But yes, there are some uh, issues around um, as, you know, these rivers are so big, uh, huge, uh, the velocity and other, other, other things matter. But I think the blend of this, this technology and the solution is going to be one of the major things um, in, in different part of the world. So thank you for highlighting this one. I will come up with the questions to you. Um, there are questions being asked, but I will, I will have a question answer session at the, um, at the last of this, um, this, this webinar. So we will um, we'll come up with some questions to you. Uh, now I would like to go um, with um, uh, 
Dr. Mohammed Mansur Rahman, Professor at the uh, Institute of Water and Flood Management at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. So, um, Dr. Mohammed Rahman, you have 15 minutes. Please, um, you know, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it was uh, nice to listen from Professor Mohanta about the Indian part of the problem and prospect and potential of the bioengineering issues. So, um, in 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 my in in my presentation, I will I will try to. Um, address uh, the, the, the science behind uh, riverbank erosion and uh, uh, to, to have a solution uh, against such situation, we need to know the uh, kind of diagnosis of the system, of the river system uh, that is uh, continuously changing with time and space. For example, in India, and in Bangladesh and Nepal, the, the same river is behaving in different way. And uh, maybe 50 years back and after 50 years, the same river will behave in different way. So the temporal and spatial uh, behavior of the rivers are very important to understand. Uh, so we need to have a good diagnosis of the system. And uh, to, that, to do that, um, I have uh, arranged uh, uh, my discussion points about the uh, trends of flow and sediment in the South Asian rivers and its implications to river bank erosion. And uh, definitely, uh, we need to know actually how these rivers are uh, changing with time in terms of its important elements like sandbars and the channels and uh, that are uh, also ultimately impacting to river bank erosion. And uh, the factors behind the problem of traditional uh, river bank uh, protection work actually. So uh, this is uh, one of the very uh, important issue that we need to consider and uh, um, how we are going to uh, use a, a kind of um, solution that will have a good uh, compromise with the natural system of the river at the same time ensuring the safety security ecological social benefits to the system so all this uh, i'll try to uh, highlight during these uh, short and brief presentations so as you know uh, the system is coming uh, and the ending to Bangladesh, to the Bay of Bengal. Through a big number of the basin, large number of the basins, large number of many rivers are accumulating together and going to the uh, Bay of Bengal. And uh, more than 50 plus rivers coming to Bangladesh are basically um, uh, transboundary in nature. And uh, as you know, in the transboundary rivers, the flow and sediment, sediment in terms, you can also uh, say the nutrient because sediment is consisting with the nutrient of different mineralogy and mineral content coming from different kind of sea uh, mountains because each of the mountains are com composite with a different kind of minerals and it is coming to the system downstream. And that's why each of the system are also providing relatively different kind of ecosystem uh, uh, services in terms of fisheries, say forestry, aquaculture, so many different kind of uh, ecosystem services in each of the uh, system. And we cannot find the services or fisheries composition that we are getting in the Brahmaputra Jomuna system. The same things will be happening in the Ganges system. So it's different. So it's very, very important <clears throat> to have the free flow uh, system. Uh, rather than have intervent system. And in addition to that, in the intervent system, we have a number of different interventions to withdraw water and sediment. When we are withdrawing water through different water diversion work, the sediment are also being uh, trapped 
and more than 30% of the water and sediment coming from the basin are being withdrawn, withdrawn in different regions of these basins. So uh, eventually we are getting less sediment, but the monsoon uh, water flow is increasing because of the climate change, but the net sediment inflow to the system is decreasing because of the human interventions. So with, with, with that perspective, if we look at the uh, future, the present and future of uh, the different uh, interventions that are planned within the system, it will severely impact the water and uh, sediment, natural inflow of the water and sediment. And uh, uh, it is definitely going to have uh, the less uh, sediment within the system, which is very much important for the um, uh, for the stability of the river system here and also for the sustainability of the uh, delta in the most downstream part because these systems are the, the co is consisting with water and sediment and if the regime of water and sediment are changing the system will behave in a different way both spatially and temporarily so it is very very important to keep this thing in mind otherwise we cannot have a good solution and and one unique solution in the system is never possible because you know the system is changing as in a very dynamic way with the variability of the water nutrients sediment etc so we need to have, be very innovative how to deal with the system with the changing approach attitude within the people living in this region so um if we look at bangladesh um, the bangladesh uh, have three major rivers uh, say Ganges, uh, the Brahmaputra Jamuna, and uh, uh, Meghna. And all these rivers are consisting with different kind of flow and sediment re regime. That's why the rivers are showing um, the different kind of uh, plant form, the formation of sandbars, uh, the river bank erosion uh, potentials, etc. We cannot uh, uh, try to apply the the, the solution that is effective in some region that other region may not be effective. And also uh, the, the solutions that, are, that were effective previously, it may not be effective. So we have to be very innovative and try to understand how the system are changing. So if we would, look, if we would uh, like to uh, see the... Um, if you would like to see the um, how the channel changes in the um, uh, say Padma River system, we can see the Padma River system is changing with time, and its corridor is also changing. You can clearly see this uh, this this block or beyond the main river, but it is again coming to the river system. So, uh, and, and this is a, a systematic um, a meandering river system that is being generated uh, within uh, uh, this region. And uh, in terms of the uh, Jomuna Brahmaputra system, if we look at this uh, area in a very uh, closed loop, then we can see uh, the, the, the system is also variable with time. So, if we look uh, uh, from uh, 1984 to 2018, so always changing, but there is a kind of corridor uh, beyond that the river is not shifting. And um, these uh, rivers are changing in composition with the channels and the sandbars or chores locally we say. And the formation of this kind of different kind of rivers are not uh, happening randomly. We are uh, clearly understood that the river system are uh, the river platforms are forming in composition of the of the hydraulic gradient of the system the type of the sediment flowing within the system and the channel width or depth uh, etc and depending on that the some rivers are very very less stable some are uh, a very uh, uh, stable river. For example, this is the lo lowly stable part of the river system within this regime. And you know, the, 
the velocity, sediment transport, et cetera, changing with time and also with the space. So qualitatively, we can see there are some relationships. And in, in more quantitative way, you can also see that the some rivers are falling in some area. For example, the Jomuna River, the Jomuna Bhumaputra River in Bangladesh are falling within the uh, limit of the braided multi-channel river. So if we want to make it a single channel for land reclamation or some other, other reason, uh, I think there will be the, uh, the problem that we are going to fight with the system. The, the system doesn't like to be uh, uh, here, but we are trying the system to take it from this place to here. Then uh, there will be a, 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 a problem, I think. And um, that's why it is very, very important to try to understand the system uh, as a system. For example, um, um, if we would like to uh, see minutely how the channels and the chores are changing uh, in each of the years, even in the braided river, it is, it is following some set of rules and regulations, not very chaotic. So we have to understand the natural rules and regulations of the system and try to handle the system, keeping its natural tendency as much as possible and also at the same time derive the benefit from this system for the socio-economic and ecological achievements uh, uh, and also the reducing the disasters, etc. So if we look at the close view of some of the sandbars or chores, then you can see that with time, the chores are changing. And depending on the changes of the location of the sandbars, the changes of the main flow or heating point, the riverbank erosion are also changing. And if we look at a more close view, the, the main flow hitting the bank is almost tangential to the sandbars. So the sandbars are the important element that are creating the deviation of the flow towards the uh, uh, bank and the bank erosion is happening. So without understanding the, the, this kind of uh, natural processes, if we are try, trying to have a kind of river bank protection in this area, for example, um, uh, that we, we, we found that the parkopine, bioengineering, uh, growing, revetment, et cetera. And if it is not fundamentally, um, uh, uh, is, is, is not accommodating within the system or the, it is uh, debating or creating a lot of adverse uh, situation to the natural system, then it will eventually not be successful. We can see some example of the river bank erosion in, in Bangladesh, something like that in the, along the Jamuna River. And if we look at the protection works, uh, several protection works we provided depending on the situation and also uh, based on the demands of the local and the, and the central governments. And if we look uh, at these um, uh, protection works, we never uh, tried to have the insight actually what the river want to do and what we want to do. So we need to have a kind of compromise between the river's desire and our desire to make a kind of harmony within the system. For example, uh, these are the massive riverbank protection works uh, recently uh, we adopted in Bangladesh as a kind of, uh, uh, is, is a, this kind of protection work, it costed nearly one uh, meter, linear meter protection work costed roughly 20,000 US dollars. It's, it's, it's very, very expensive and costly. And even then, uh, this kind of say uh, growing like structure that deviate flow towards the river uh, from the river bank and then the expectation is that, that this this structure will provide the uh, uh, the safety uh, of the river bank and uh, also some kind of spars are uh, provided to deviate the flow and then uh, make the safety uh, uh, of the bank against the river bank and recently uh, trying to have a special kind of uh, uh, growing development combination to have land reclamation because Bangladesh is a highly densi densely uh, dense country and the government is always trying to have a kind of uh, more land, more land, but without uh, very often we cannot consider 
uh, the land uh, needed for the river or the land needed for the corridor of the river. So uh, as a consequence, you can see this one linear meter costed around 20,000 uh, US dollar. That is also not sustaining. It's a, in March, it was intact and in July, it was severely damaged. And similar kind of damage, even whatever the expense or money we're providing, we cannot provide the safety because we need to know the natural fluvial processes of the system. Otherwise, uh, without a proper diagnosis of the system, it cannot be achieved. This is our uh, recent understanding. And you can see a lot of uh, effective or ineffective or damaged part of different kind of structure that we provided historically we have. And we have effective, that it doesn't indicate that it is very successful. If we apply these things in other places, it may not be effective. So the argument is we need to have a kind of diagnostic understanding of the uh, of a river system. Um, uh, and here I'm providing with the particular reference of the Brahmaputra Jomuna River in Bangladesh. And uh, the, the target is to allow the river within the free flowing river, within the river corridor, that will not erode or flood outside the corridor and will provide optimized ecological, socio-economical and environmental services. These are very, very important because economical services may not be sustainable if we don't provide the sustainable ecological services. So uh, we need to have a kind of uh, trade-off between how we can handle this, uh, these things and uh, may not be possible always. So new knowledge, new information, new innovation should be a continuous process how to do it. But right now, the way that we are thinking is, for example, if we have a number of different kind of interventions in the river in terms of the percentage of the uh, interventions, in the natural corridor, then we can try to see the land reclamation amount, then definitely the policymakers will be interested to have more land. But if we would like to have a, a kind of say information, that is um, how, uh, how the uh, river will behave uh, under the certain level of changes, then you can see uh, if we have a kind of a yearly uh, flow simulation, the, the, this, this is only showing the flow simulation, then you can see the how the flow is changing and, and the higher uh, flow velocity indicating that some additional problems will be evolving in some area. So we can have a number of choices from this kind of detailed uh, understanding of the system. If we have a number of interventions, then how it will behave, uh, something like that. So, uh, uh, Again, if we have, we need to know the actually the socio-ecological and economic benefits from the system. There is a kind of optimum condition for having social and economic benefit and at the same time, the ecological benefit. It may not match together. But when we are going to have a long-term uh, sustainable solution from the system that will benefit the people in this region, then I think the safety security should be should be coupled with the ecological benefits as well to have the uh, uh, sustainable economical benefit. Otherwise, the economical benefit in the long run may not be uh, achieved. For example, uh, when we talk about the dredging of the river system to have the navigability, ensure the navigability or sometime to ensure to, to uh, have the uh, to protect the area from riverbank erosion uh, through deviation of the flow. And then if we plan to have the intelligent, the dredging um, uh, over the year, it is not effective because you know, the dredging is very, very expensive. And we need to know actually the, the, the diagnostic, the, the trend of the river system. And if we look at in 2004 and 2019, you can see the same channel within the river, it's changing something like that. So after a certain time, this channel will again be abundant. And then if we, we cut something like very small channel here, then eventually we can match with the tendency of the channel uh, through uh, having some small cut. And that will provide 
uh, a kind of uh, a solution uh, and we term this intelligent daging not severe daging but need based uh, time specific space specific daging and it will be very very uh, useful uh, and professor then, um, rahman uh, time is uh, running out so just you know uh, yeah alerting so, you yeah. yeah so so i this is the last slide and um, uh, the real time monitoring system is very important for this system and uh, as we mentioned that the river will never be meandering if it is the in the in the nature of the braided so we need to have a kind of innovative uh, idea like a bundle like structure that is being used uh, in the, for the navigational maintenance and then uh, we have a lot of exper experiment and then finally some field applications and then we we see it's a very very potential uh, 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 infrastructure generated by the local knowledge and in terms of the bioengineering or in vegetation in between it can be much benefited something like that this, this is the sedimentation so with this uh, thank you very much uh, and i'm sorry for taking little more time thank you okay bye uh, no worries uh, professor it was a wonderful uh, presentation thank you for your uh, wonderful insights um you have few um real very uh, pertinent questions actually uh, you have said that you know the system doesn't like but we like it so how do we you know um you know, uh, you know, couple our desires and the nature's desire, right? So that is the major question. And then um, you also raised a very important question about, uh, I mean, the, the perspective about the regime of water and the sediment um, needs to be understood well, because if you change this regime, uh, you don't know how it will behave. And then you don't know how to, you know, um, you know, act upon, and then you will be in loss, right? So these are the major uh, you know, in the problems that we 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 uh, we should uh, really think about. So, uh, before intervening the river systems, we need to uh, know um, much, and then uh, you know we have we should have a, a lot of knowledge about how it works and then act upon. So, thank you, uh, Professor. It was wonderful um, insight. So, definitely there are a lot of questions. I'll come back with the questions um, after a couple of presentations we have. Uh, thank you for your time and um, the presentation. I will go with the third presenter, um, Edward Boyda. Aid, um, the, I mean, over to you. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody. Um, let me start my screen share here. Is my is my screen visible now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, thank Amy for in inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I'm going to talk about. Um, some ways in which you can um, bring insights um, from satellite imagery to enhance reporting on the topics that we're discussing today. Um, so let's see. There we go. Um, so if it <coughs> if it feels like you're seeing um, satellite imagery used in journalism a lot more these days, that's um, because there's a lot more of it available. Um, this is a picture of two. Um, basically shoebox size uh, satellites being launched from the International Space Station. And um, there's been a, a, um, a real explosion of Earth observing satellites being put into space in the last decade. And now there are many hundreds um, that are regularly taking pictures of the surface of the, the planet. Um, satellite imagery is, <clears throat> so one thing that it, it gives you is a, is a faithful record of um, processes on the surface of the planet and you know particularly useful in places that are inaccessible or um, if you need to go back in time to see um, how things have changed as um, if you're thinking about this as, as compared to drone footage which can be um, wonderful and really sharp and, and, and detailed in, in some cases but also can be hard to get access to so we use satellite imagery um, for investigative work, um, for uh, extracting data from imagery, and also, of course, for um, putting a picture to uh, whatever story it is that you're describing. And um, because mostly today what I'm going to do is do some sort of uh, rough initial exploration of um, riverbank erosion using um, satellite, and particularly in Google Earth, um, I just wanted to give um, a uh, picture of a completed product, um, product or project uh, this, to give a sense of, of what's possible um, with the medium. 
So this is, this is work that, um, that was published in uh, June of this year. It's about um, illegal small-scale gold mining in the northern Brazilian Amazon and, um, that we did in, in partnership with um, the Reuters graphics team and do the really beautiful graphics work that you see. Um, and so first off, this was an investigative project. We knew from um, reports on the ground that there was a, a huge explosion of mining in this area, um, and we wanted to go uh, get a sense of the scale and scope of, of what was going on um, from satellite. And so over a, a, a period of many months, we um, identified over 200 new mines um, from the last few years. Um, so that was the investigative work. This is one of the, the data outputs that was a part of this, the, the reporting. These are actual footprints of mines collected to show a sense of the, the scale and expansion from um, you know, sort of 2015-16 to um, present day. This is a soccer field to, to scale to give you a sense. Um, and then, of course, we wanted to put a picture to what's going on. And um, in this image, you see uh, the healthy Amazon rainforest um, turned into mud pits and wastewater ponds. And, and there's a lot of mercury used in the process of gold extraction. And of course, that ends up in in the river and a lot of this is uh, the story is about the impacts on the local communities of the um, the miners that have come into this area to do this work um, but anyway that just a sense uh, of of what's possible in in terms of investigation data and um, visualization with this medium um, let me skip that so what i want to do today uh, um, is just do some work with Google Earth and uh, some, as I said, some initial exploration. Google Earth is the tool that I turn to first whenever I'm starting to work on a new story. Um, the, the Google Earth Pro Desktop Edition provides uh, a decent and ex easily accessible collection of historical imagery for the whole world. And so it's a great place to just start looking around. Um, and this is something, it's easy to download um, and install on your um, desktop computer. Um, and so th this is a great first way to get into using satellite imagery in your reporting. And I'm, sh I'm sure that many of you already are familiar with this tool. I hope that, um, that there's some new insight just in sort of seeing how I work with it that, that comes out of this for you. Um, there's a, a, a funny story with regards to that. I, I remembered as I was putting this presentation together that the, the um, the story about the gold mining um, in the um, in the Amazon uh, actually kind of rubbishes the rest of my talk. I um, when I first went to look for the mines, I was using Google Earth and couldn't find any, and I put the project aside for several months, and and then realized that the because the imagery is so hard to collect in that in that region because of the the cloud cover. Um, that Google Earth didn't actually have recent enough imagery to see the mines and I had to go to other sources. So just a caveat about what's, uh, what's coming. But um, so uh, this is when, when you launch Google Earth, um, this is uh, the interface that you'll see. Um, I've zoomed into the area that we're gonna be working in. Um, sorry. <clears throat> This is um, Bangladesh, uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and uh, Myanmar. And you notice that I've, I've put a few pins here. I'm gonna focus on two examples. The first is an, an island um, at the confluence of the Padma and Meghna rivers, um, where there have been uh, tens of thousands of people um, displaced in that area um, uh, in recent years. And um, it just w would point out there, there's another pin here, which says Padma erosion and a town lost. And I, that's another very similar example to the one I'm going to show you that I found just by once, you know, sorry, I, I knew what to look for, just going up the river and um, exploring in Google Earth, like what I'm going to do with you in just a minute. Um, so that there's, there's more to be found um, if that's of interest. Um, and then the second example um, I'm going to look at is in the, Koshi or Kosi um, uh, River at the Nepal-India border, where the story is about the, the interaction between um, embankments built by in, um, in co a collaborative effort between the uh, Nepalese and Indian governments in the 1950s and um, the impacts 
or in a relationship of those embankments with um, flooding in the communities in that area. So um, <clears throat> if I zoom in on this, uh, on the island, the confluence of, this is the Padma and this is the uh, Meghna River, um, this is what you see. And the first thing that I would want to do is um, use the, the button here, the clock icon, to bring up the historical collection of, of imagery for this area. And then you get this bar, which shows you the uh, available images. Um, and at this zoomed out level, um, there's about uh, an image, uh, one image per year going back to 1984 that's, that's available in Google Earth. And so the first thing I want to do is just walk, walk back in time. And uh, I've just taken a lot of screen captures of my interactions with Google Earth here. Um, so, and what I want you to observe is just the, the ongoing change that's happening in this, in this river. This is 2006, and this is 2001. Um, and this is 1989. And so the first thing that I notice is just that this, uh, the river is continually redrawing the landscape. The landscape is ever changing, which is, um, was different than my, my expectation coming, um, coming to this topic for the first time. Um, and in particular, you notice that in 2001, this, this island was, was not an island, um, it, was, it was river. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in closer to that pin, um, and again, at this time, notice um, we have uh, my, the slider up here is telling me now we're in 2002. And there's also um, the image date, which is more accurately reflected is, is down here. Um, what you see is, is not a pretty picture. It's, it's water and mud flats. Um, and I'm going to step forward in time now for you. And what you see here, um, caveat about using Google Earth, that there's inconsistencies and in, um, image uh, coverage and quality, but um, you're seeing, so you're still seeing the old 2002 image there and then now, now a 2012 image um, on the right and you see a community has built up. Um, and uh, now 2014, we, we get a nice view of this, um, of this community. And uh, so I, I've, I've said that it's, it's like, it looks like a durable community to me. And some of the things that, that catch my eye when I'm looking at this image are, okay, so you, first of all, you see a lot of, of houses and, and um, other buildings. You see, and you can look, especially if I, we zoomed in a little further, you would see in these, um, you can see the construction here. That these are, I think, metal roofs, um, but they're, they're pitched metal roofs and they look, um, you know, like they've, they've been, um, like there's a very uh, sort of, you know, regular solid construction. These are meant to, to last. Um, you see that paths or roads have sprung up. You see vegetation has grown up around the houses. You see boats moored along this sort of inland, um, inland waterway. And um, if we advance further in time from 2014 to 2017, you see that um, the river has actually reclaimed some of this community. Um, and uh, one thing I, I, want, I want to check to make sure that this is a real effect and, and that not just some artifact of the images being poorly um, registered spatially. And so, so I, I look at this road, for instance, and, I, and if I go back to the previous image you can, and, and flip back and forth, you can see that that road is stable. Um, and similarly, if you look at um, over here, say the, the structure of the, the embankments, you can see that that's fairly stable. Oh, sorry, I just gave away the, the last bit. But, um, Sorry, we, we want to see the st stability there, which convinces us that the loss of this part of the community there is real. Um, and you see now there are boats moored where there had been been houses and um, and farms. And then finally, if we go forward to 2019, um, we see that the, the entire um, community has been reclaimed by the river. So, so for for one thing, this. Um, the set of images, 2014, 2017, 2019, puts a real picture to the, um, a, a story of displacement in this area and, and shows, you know, very obviously the people that were living there had to find new places to live and new, place, new land to farm. Um, if you wanted to take this and put this in a, you know, for digital storytelling, if you're, if you're it depends on sort of your, the infrastructure that you're, your website is powered by, but if it's say WordPress, there's you know an option for an image carousel, which should be available as a plugin out of the box, and you can slot um, three images into, or you ask your web developer to conjure the 
the standard JavaScript to do that. Um, okay, um, I, I, let's see, uh, next example. Um, so this is the Kosi or Koshi River. Um, it, it flows out of the Himalaya foothills and, and crosses the Nepal-India border here. Um, just to give you an overview and um, now zoomed in around the area of this um, dam. And so like I mentioned briefly, the, there was a cooperative effort between in Nepal and India in the 1950s to build embankments along this river. And I'll show you what they look like in a minute um, to keep the river um, channeled, to keep it from um, at regular periods during um, you know, monsoon season, it would flood outside um, this channel. And so they, they wanted to keep it um, channeled within this region. Um, and it apparently has been successful in, in doing that um, in large part, um, but there were 300 some villages within the embankments. And, and although there were some attempts to resettle people um, outside um, of that area between the embankments, some tens of thousands of people are still there and um, face the consequences of this ever changing um, river and landscape. And um, so that's what we're gonna look at. Um, so first of all, I'm in we're in 2001, we're looking at this river. Um, I just no stepping forward in time, notice first of all, you can, you can see um, uh, the river meandering um, significantly within its embankments from the main channel being at the top part of um, the area to the middle. And then in 2009, it's now middle and bottom, the main flow of the river. Um, you'll also notice something interesting has happened between these two images um, uh, in the upper right part of the image. And so this is in, in the 2008 monsoon season, there was a major breach of the embankments here and flooding that impacted two to three million people downstream, um, uh, both directly from the flooding and also from silt deposition. And that's what you're seeing here is the, depo the, the silt deposited um, from the flooding, which I understand has to be cleared before um, that land can be farmed again. Um, <clears throat> uh, so zooming in, um, this is monsoon season, August 2017. And you see that the, the, the area between the embankments is um, completely full of water. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, so th this is the sort of embankments at work. Um, I'm going to now zoom in on this area of relatively high land to see what's happening to the community there during this time. And you can see that um, the you still see some field like field structures, but the, the tan there that's muddy water. So the the fields are underwater, and you can see that the water is in mixed in and around um, their buildings. So th there's this on, ongoing um, routine flooding that people there face, um, and this is a way of sort of getting us getting a sense for for what's going on. Um, now I've moved just slightly south, south of that village that we were looking at. So you can see the, the embankment and what it looks like and you see some of the structures that um, we saw earlier in the webinar. Um, these the, sort of the long um, uh, dike embankment with these um, perpendicular um, uh, dikes projecting into the river and, and capturing um, uh, deposed silt and building up the embankment. And finally, I wanna um, zoom here to uh, structure here and, and structure there that, that look interesting and just I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, so um, what I see here is just this, this regular structure here tells me that, that this, this has got to be some sort of planting going on, which is a surprise. It's um, as far as I understand, the silt is hard to plant in, although it um, may be possible um, to grow wheat there. So this is, this is a, a question that I would want to follow up on. Um, you know, how are people using the, the land, these shifting um, sandbars for agriculture in this um, between embankment area. And then um, over here, what I see is some scouring, so this is sort of irregular scouring of the sand. And you see the, the, the darker um, soil appearing from beneath the sand here. And this to me actually looks somewhat like um, sand mining and we have actually have some work coming out on sand mining in South Asia rivers soon. And this kind of follows that same pattern, but then I would wanna ask, you know, do I see dump trucks? Do I see 
um, large scale digging equipment. And I don't, I, so I've looked at a few images here. And so that tells me that it's probably not industrial large scale sand mining, but maybe something more, you know, ad hoc and local, some, some recapture of sediment there for reasons that I don't I, know. Um, just a time reminder, sorry. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, so, uh, that's, um, th this, I'm basically at the end of my talk here. Um, what, I, what I hope, you know, was, came out of this was just the idea of, of, you know, how to look at satellite imagery, the types of things you can see and how it might prompt, you know, ideas for further exploration. If you actually want to um, publish imagery, um, you, the Google Earth, you can export images. They have a fair use policy. Um, I know some editors that don't like to work with that for various reasons. Um, and you might want to go to source. Um, and I've pr prepared a cheat sheet of, um, or just a list of, of resources where you can go to get, um, get imagery. It does become a difficult medium to work with to some extent. Um, there are two, um, so I'll, I'll post a link to that in the chat once I'm done talking here. Um, but very broadly, there's a couple of categories. There are the public space agencies, NASA, um, European Space Agency, that produce um, uh, sort of low resolution imagery, which is good for looking at landscapes, um, towns, things on that scale. And then if you want to really see detail, buildings, vehicles, things, things like that, you need to go to the new, newer commercial providers of high resolution satellite imagery. So in that sheet, I'll give you some guidance on how to go about doing that. Um, you can also contact us. We have some um, internal budget for supporting um, environmental, um, uh, environmental reporting with satellite imagery. And so if you want to talk, talk a story with us, um, talk it through, um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, and I think I'll just skip this last piece. That, and um, that's my email, boyd at earthrise.media and our website. Um, and thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Aid. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for your, um, um, you know, um, if, if you would like to post any um, links, please do with in the uh, chat box. That will be helpful for people. And also, um, some have asked for some uh, presentations. So uh, you, if you can um, send us your email or, you know, um, uh, to us or, um, we can we can send you the uh, the presentation as well. I think that will be, that won't be a problem for our uh, presenters as well. Um, so um, um, so let's let's go with um, another uh, presentation um, um, from Naveen. Um, he works with the BBC. Uh, so Naveen, um, please um, uh, go ahead with your presentation. Tob will uh, is helping us. He is behind the scene. So he's the man who is managing all those things. Thank you, Tob. Um, so Tob will help um, to um, use the um, uh, slide. Please um, go ahead. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Tob, just to make sure that you have it ready, yeah? There won't be an issue. <laughs> I, I'm sorry about this because I had issue with my new Mac, so I'm having to take his help. So there we go. All right, so guys, up until now, we were really zooming in into all these issues. And now I will try to zoom it out. Uh, a, first of all, I'm a journalist, so I have no expertise as such in terms of you know, all those details. Uh, but I think I can try to share with you what I do in terms of identifying stories and what's the bigger picture. That's why I called it zooming it out. You know? So we were zooming in all the time, looking at all those great satellite pictures, all the professors telling us about all those uh, technologies, all those ideas. They're all great. Uh, they're really, really great. I learned so many things. But what I think here is uh, we have an evolving picture which is going to stay with us for quite some time now. And therefore, this particular issue we're talking about, riverbank erosion, is just not going to go away. And that's why the topic here is climate change, of course, you know it. And then what's happening right now, the COVID pandemic. So what's the nexus? That's my presentation. Next slide, please. So to start with, I'm sure you, you know this thing, you know, if, if, if climate change is a shark, water is its teeth. We all know it. So, you know, I mean, all around the world, we are seeing this increasingly happen. Of course, there are other issues. We are seeing wildfires. We are seeing dust storms. But then if you look at it, majority of, of all these disasters 
what we, we, and this thing that we're talking about in this in this program is definitely about water. Next slide, please. That's it. So riverbank erosion is about water. Uh, that's what I meant to say. This was some time back. Uh, if you remember, there was a sudden unexpected uh, flash flood from Tibet into Nepal. Uh, so we went there, we saw this, all these houses were hanging by. They were all rattled by earthquake and comes the river. And then, you know, uh, we saw that, we followed the river and then we went to the border area of Nepal, India, where there was this very old, uh, barrage, the Kosi barrage, which has outlived its, its life. So if there are more and more of this kind of thing, the most downstream country, even Bangladesh. Next slide, please. I don't have expertise on this soil erosion topic like scientists, but you know, uh, I see these kind of things warning coming up. So compared to the natural formation of soil, we are losing more and more. That's what I read in this, this document, uh, you know, Nature published just last year. And which is like, so, you know, are we talking about something, uh, you know, remote kind of thing, few communities, and then just because the subject is not being touched upon and therefore we're trying to uh, look into it. No, it's got, you know, this food security thing. So you see, food security is, is a global issue. You know, it's, 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 it's to do with all the people around the world. And ecosystem viability, should I tell you how important this, this is now? Because, you know, particularly in the wake of climate change and now even in the wake of this pandemic, how important natural safeguards are, I shouldn't be, be telling you this. Next slide, please. So even before COVID, you know, we had water-related extreme events. I mean, you know that all the time. For instance, you know, this uh, lady we, we interviewed, if you remember after the Doklam standoff between China and India, so we broke the story about how China stopped sharing hydrological data with India in terms of the water flow of Brahmaputra. So I was sent to the ground immediately, uh, you know, after I broke that story. And then, you know, we found out how these villages, how these communities were telling us, you know, uh, fairy tale stories like how the river levels do go up, boom, comes down, you know. And then she was telling me that, you know, she was, she's moved her house five times already in the, in the past, in recent years. So we had all these issues even before COVID, extreme weather events, you know, in terms of uh, water, soil erosion, displacement, and so on and so forth, all across the region. Next slide, please. So there you go, you see. When I did, uh, that the, 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 the previous slide I showed about the Potikosi River when this sudden unexpected flash flood from Tibet. Just when I brought that story out, so we had this uh, a scientific report telling us that uh, the roof of the world, and so, so what they did was they listed all these places around the world where water bodies were expanding. And Tibet is top on the list, you see. So that's very important for us downstream countries, whether that's India or Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, or even Pakistan for that matter, you know, all these downstream countries, uh, what are they do and what will, what, what consequences are these bodies being monitored? What will happen if they, if they, you know, burst out glacial lakes, their catchment areas, you know, what's, what's the river system there? How many rivers are linked with these bodies? What are bodies? Do we have enough, in, enough information? So you see, I mean, water-related issues were already massive issue before COVID-19. I'm getting into COVID-19. Next slide, please. So, you know, just before COVID-19, just to recap, so the world needed to do five times more than what it had pledged, what countries had pledged to keep temperature rise, you know, below two degrees, as you know, that's the Paris climate goal. And uh, what, they what they found out was, you know, uh, that, you know, countries did sign that document, the Paris Agreement, the Accord, but what they found was uh, that, you know, the, the calculation uh, maths didn't work. They found out that, you know, it was grossly inadequate. And, and countries needed to do five times more. And then the UN calculation came out saying that, you know, countries needed to do 7%. They needed to cut down 7% of their annual emissions each year, this ticket. 
if that target of, of, of keeping global average temperature rise well below two degrees is to be met. Next. So just then, you know, just, just then what, when the, those, are, those warnings came, so we, we saw COVID, it took over everything. And as you know, COP26, the climate change conference that, you know, uh, was supposed to happen here in the UK, in Glasgow, it was canceled. Uh, there have been some virtual meetings and then climate negotiations, you know, hardly moving anywhere. Some countries have, have submitted their uh, climate plans, as you know, within the uh, uh, Paris Agreement, countries are supposed to submit their raised ambitions each five years so that, you know, we, we are in, on track to meet that, the, 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 the goal of, of keeping world, global temperature well below two degrees. But again, like, you know, some of, some of those indices were submitted. So that's, that's the nationally determined contributions indices, climate plans, basically. And they've been criticized for not being any progressive. Even New Zealand, you see, for example, New Zealand has a solid track record in terms of acting on, on environmental issues. Even New Zealand was criticized. So this is all happening, you know, uh, not a good sign. And, and climate agenda almost totally eclipsed by COVID-19. Next slide, please. So just then, you know, we started hearing about this green recovery. So global leaders started talking about, you know, fine, we have this COVID situation, but then, you know, you know and, then, and then there were concerns that if, if, if the countries now, if they embark into rebooting their economies, then they might sideline, forget climate change altogether. And that way we might be jumping from the fire, from the pan into the fire. So, so, there was the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, if you remember, and by and large, the leaders agreed that, yes, you know, while we are rebooting our economies, we'll have to take care of climate change. And actually, this could be a, an opportunity that, you know, when we are dealing with, 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 with the economies to reboot our economies, then we can really focus on those uh, climate-friendly policies. And therefore, we started hearing about smart climate policies, build back better, you know, all those things. But actually, you know, Seeing all these good words, phrases, and listening to leaders, that's okay, but, but is it happening? That's the question. Next slide, please. So ominous sign, as I said. So, you know, Bloomberg has done, done this calculation. So what they've found is, of the $12 trillion committed by 50 largest economies to coronavirus recovery, not even 1%, you see, that's very important. Not even 1% have been targeted for climate-friendly economic activities. That is a very, very disturbing finding, okay? And just to remind you, see, I'm trying to give you a global picture because that global picture is what will shape our local situations and river erosion is definitely a part of it. Next slide, please. Just a reminder for your time. Okay, right, great. So, so here we go. We had all this, uh, you know, big emitters talking about, you know, uh, India has embarked into Coal now, it aspires to be the largest uh, exporter. Next slide, please. And then China, of course, you've, you saw China, you know, it's, it's, it, it's now it's, it's 250 gigawatt of coal fired power plants being planned. China is another thing. Next slide, please. Although China has aimed to be carbon neutral by 2060. Now, what does that mean? You know, we're not clear about the thing. The figure is quite encouraging. China has uh, uh, earned applause, but we don't know what that means. Let's see. Next slide. Next, next slide, please. And then must I tell you about what the U.S. position is? You see, this is enough. Like, you know, all this when California is burning, what Trump had to say. So, you know, I'm just trying to point you where, where we're heading towards. Next slide, please. So what does it mean for us? Already in the red, even this was even before, you know, this was calculated even before COVID. But now when with all those slides, what I showed just now, imagine before COVID, we had a situation like that. Scientists were warning us that you have to do five times more. And after COVID, you know, major players are going back gears practically. So imagine what will that mean for us? Next slide. So you see, again, the same story. What will happen to our rivers if, if climate changes, if, if, if warming goes berserk, if uncontrollably, then what will happen to our river systems, to our, you know, all those water towers, to the north, down the stream, question. Next slide, please. 
you know, for the people, this story we did just now, you see, for example, look at that, you know, so the combination of what happens when, 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 you know, uh, coronavirus and, and extreme climate events, if they collide, life becomes unlivable. Next. So you see, this is one of my final things. So what we have to understand is when we're talking about rivers and adaptation was already our agenda, you know, our region, of course, we have got major uh, emitters like India, the third largest emitter, but, but still the rest of us, you see, uh, for us, adaptation has been the thing because we are minor emitters. Uh, it was our agenda, but now think about climate refugees in the wake of all this, what I showed to you now, if, if climate, if the uh, average global temperature, ri temperature rise does not stay within that control, then everything is, is going to be very, very dangerous. But the question now is where will that money come from? Because those donor countries, they themselves are in the red, you see? So that is a very, very important thing for us. How will we deal with this double whammy and, and rivers, of course? So it's a matter of survival matters. Next, please. So we might get rid of coronavirus. We might, you know, if there's a vaccination, if there are other ways, but next slide, please. Will we be able to get rid of these disasters? That's the question. And I think, why am I highlighting this is, why am I telling you, I, my assumption is that majority of us here are journalists, even if you are not, that means there are stories, plethora of stories waiting for us to be told. It's not going to go away. And this wider, bigger picture, that's why I zoomed out to tell you that the story, the issue is going to be more and more serious. Thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, we have a lot of stories to tell, um, um, and then we um, we are a bit, uh, running out of time. But thank you for uh, all of you uh, with the wonderful presentation and information uh, that has been quite helpful. There are a lot of questions being asked. Um, I will just summarize a few questions and start with the Q and A session. Um, I'll go with uh, Professor Mohanta. Um, feel free to go to the Q and A section, section and then see if there are some questions for you as well. So you can just you know. Um, um, you can respond um, accordingly, but there are a few um, questions that I summarize. Uh, to Professor Mahanta, um, uh, there's a question saying, are these solutions um, implementable in uh, chars in Assam? Uh, Bursa from India, she has asked this question. Uh, Basanta from Nepal, he asks a positive and negative effect of this type of bioengineering in relation to bank failure. So what is that um, kind of thing? Um, um, you know, he would like to um, get an answer. And then there's one question, uh, is this geotextile uh, being used in Dibrugar um, in Assam? And then to Professor Mansoor, um, uh, there's a question about how this illegal sand extraction and uh, is if impacting uh, river erosion. So first uh, let's go with Dr. Mohanta and then uh, Dr. Mansoor. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sure uh, there would not be much time to answer uh, questions very elaborately, but let me just kind of <clears throat> speak that, you know, as of now, our uh, approach have been traditional and conventional, mainly because uh, it has been a practice and there are money and there are funding issues and all. The river is very dynamic. Uh, most Asian rivers are, and we recognize that one fifth of the sediment for all the global sediment comes from the Tibetan River. So you can understand a dynamic river needs a dynamic solution, but uh, one size doesn't fit all. So probably, you know, the answer is that something like that every flood season, you need to have a very quick run up of the entire river stretch through drone based survey and prepare yourself for a solution for that particular season. Basically, the time run up time is very important. And uh, most of the time we fail because by the time we execute a project as a response, the actual situation in the river changes over a long period of time. So <clears throat> here is the case perhaps dividing the river into smaller segments and we have been maintaining you know, some of us that at a basin scale, you need a kind of a digital river to a prototype river, to a model river, to a smart river. Essentially, you need a lot of smart response to rivers and it can be a mix of structural and non-structural interventions together where it really fits properly and also then, you know, getting back to maintenance in the next flood season or next erosion season becomes much easier. So uh, essentially it needs a kind of a basin scale approach with uh, everybody coming together. And as Professor Mansur also maintained, uh, sort of, you know, understanding the river philosophically 
and then preparing for a response, how to harmonize that solution uh, kind of uh, with a trade-off. Uh, I'll not really go longer because of paucity of time, but I have given my email ID. I'd like to have your questions specifically, and I'll definitely engage with you with a more elaborate you know, explanation of each of the account. The bioengineering part, if I can put it, uh, they have been tried in some smaller tributaries very effectively. As I said, scale is an issue. For big scale intervention, I'm not sure they will really withstand a huge velocity flood like four meter per second. So clearly there is a need of a, you know, continuing with our structural intervention, but probably supplementing and complementing with bioengineering technology at local indigenous level where you can, again, the community can get back to the repair and the maintenance. So that's how it has to be. Uh, of course, right now it is still not mainstream into the departmental prerogative because of the money flow, the funding, the contractor, the trained skill manpower, all those issues. But I'm sure these are gaining uh, ground locally and somewhere the community can take over with this technology with a bit of training and a science behind it. So I'll put it at that at, at this point of time, but I'm sure these topics actually need much longer engagement and deliberation. Each of the topics presented today are actually uh, board of discussion for a couple of hours, but we will come back sometime and I'm sure those of you who are really keen to follow it up at a maybe practical application level, do get back to me. I'll be very happy to work together with you. Well, thank you, um, Professor Mansoor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the very important issue of sand mining, whether sand mining uh, is uh, accelerating the river bank erosion or not. Uh, it's a very tricky thing, actually. Uh, when we are talking about the dredging, means we are allowing the people to take uh, sand or sediment from the river uh, to keep the channel more navigable, to keep the channel away from the river bank. But you know, uh, these uh, place uh, for taking the sediment are located uh, fairly far from the river bank. So in the middle of the channel, sometimes sandbars are developing and uh, we need to, uh, 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 we need to erase this, uh, that part through the dredging so that the uh, it cannot deviate flow to the river bank. So this is one part. But when the people are engaged to dredge these things, um, it's, it's easy to take sediment from the near bank because of the time, uh, costing, and other many things. And inside the river, it's very difficult to see, to monitor what are the things happening. So uh, one example was when I was testing the bundle-like structure in the Jomuna, um, the Bangladesh Water Development Board was monitoring uh, or, or taking care of this kind of nuisance. And uh, we wanted to uh, get sediment generated behind the structure to sediment deposition, but the local people who were engaged to this sediment, they often took the sediment from our sedimented area. So the result was uh, in problem. So this is uh, definitely from the near banks uh, when the sediment is uh, mining, then river bank erosion is accelerating. We need to stop these things in, in different possible modes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Mansoor. Um, I'm gonna uh, ask a few questions uh, from the Q&A here. Um, there's a question um, to Navin. Um, from Kamal, uh, from Nepal, he wants to know what you think these countries should or must do to improve the riverbank erosion situation. And maybe relatedly, there's also a question from Faisal about um, geopolitics. Uh, as we all know, this is a transboundary issue. Um, he says, uh, you know, India is not very interested in solving the problem while it is uh, you know, where the source of the water is and Bangladesh is a low-lying area. Um, what, what do you think? Thanks. I mean, so, uh, you know, if you remember during my presentation, although I was, try I was trying to go, go global, but, you know, you can't avoid the local situation. So remember after Doklam stand of China stopped sharing its hydrological data on Brahmaputra with India. There was a massive issue. Uh, but that was uh, resolved later on. So you see, when I, when I saw those presentation on geodikes, for instance, so geodikes, you know, of course they, they might uh, serve as solutions locally. But then again, like if you look at it from a bit different prism, like, you know, there have been issues between India and Nepal, for instance. So the dikes between 
India and Nepal, you know, it kind of almost 800 uh, kilometer long border area. So there are those dikes. Those dikes have definitely helped India in terms of flood management. Uh, you know, with, 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 with due respect to the Indian side, they might have come up with that engineering. But the Nepal side has been complaining that because of that structure, you know, sweats and sweats of its land remains maroon for months and months, even if, if it's not monsoon. So definitely, you know, when you are grappling with these issues, uh, and, and especially when you're talking about transboundary rivers, even solutions can create problems at times. And that's why uh, this, this notion of, of, of a regional approach uh, is, is very important. But the question is, is that happening? We've been he hearing about regional approach, regional, regional ideas, regional meetings. There are some mechanisms at place, you know, bi even bilateral countries are doing, but is this happening? I think that is something the media will have to keep track on, follow it up, and then, you know, bring the stories out. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, those communities will be just left on their own. But I think if, if the media keeps on following this, then it definitely remains in the debate and it will definitely influence policymakers. And again, at the end of the day, we're talking about positive changes. Uh, we might be contributing to positive changes. So yes, that's how I think could be one of the ways to go. Thank you, Navin. Um, and Edward, there's a, a comment here. Uh, saying that um, just like imagery and GIS, um, it's, it's very, very useful um, for stories. And do you think it's used enough um, to inform the public? <clears throat> Sorry, um, I'm getting a message from Zoom. Um, um, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I think that it's, you know, it's an exciting, um, moment in the, in the use of um, the satellite imagery GIS is part of uh, digital storytelling in general is that these are all, um, I think people are just beginning to explore the possibilities because they haven't um, been around and accessible um, until recent years. Um, so I think again, like um, <clears throat> one thing that, that I've found that has surprised me in, in um, my work over the last few years is just the, the, the utility of satellite imagery is sort of an investigative tool as opposed to an il illustrative tool is put in one that's main purpose is just to, to corroborate or put a picture to a thing, but, but that actually in regions um, where it, it's very hard for journalists to operate, it, it gives you an opportunity to, um, to, to see what's going on. And so, so the, mine, the mining in um, the Yanomami territory in Brazil is one good example. And we've done, um, uh, we've been able to work uh, on human rights issues in, in Xinjiang in China, where it's very hard to operate as a journalist um, by using satellite imagery. So I think um, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, how this, you know, new creative uses uh, coming to the fore. Thank you, Edward. Uh, Ramesh, you said there's a question on data sharing. Yes, uh, uh, Ural Kafli from I think, Nepal, he has a question to two professors. Uh, data in South Asia is pretty much tough to get it, right? So it is so classified. And when it comes to rivers, it is really, really classified. So, um, you know, this is so scarce and sensitive. So in addition, there's uh, no major transboundary river data sharing agreements in between Nepal, India, Bangladesh, or even other countries, even China, right? So what do you think? I mean, we share the rivers, but we don't share data. So how do we tackle with this, this, this complexity? There's a question by you all. So can I, can Quickly, I, um, can I respond? Sure. Uh, yes. there, is, there is a interesting story behind uh, this kind of policy and um, in a very large scale research project when I was working with Jadapur University in India and IIT Kanpur uh, in India, uh, then um, the problem is um, the Indian part cannot share the water data. They can share the sediment data. It's, uh, it's interesting, but water is correlated with the sediment and then we, we tried to develop a, a joint work with Jadapur University that is socio-economic vulnerability of the joint GBM system. And then we indicated, we, we 
took around uh, 21 indicator and the common indicator that India could share and also Bangladesh has no limitations, something like that. Then we, we had to pick only 11 indicator. Then the, the, the work was a little weak. Uh, anyway, it is under publication. So I think uh, through this process, if the scientists are trying to work together with the limitations, whatever we have, then get eventually the country's uh, policy makers will try to understand because uh, the, uh, the, the water is sharing by the two countries. So each country is benefiting other countries. It's not, not only that water releasing, the Bangladesh is getting benefit. So there are a lot of ecosystem movement, the dynamics of the ecosystem that is going to India from Bangladesh, something like that. So it's, it's, it's a matter of understanding. So if it happens, then eventually it will be possible to do this work. I think. Thank you. Dr. Monta, do you have any comments on it? And... Yeah, uh, I'd like to agree with Professor uh, Mansoor that, you know, you need a kind of a common understanding, appreciation. I think that's growing, but it's not happening at all levels. See, this is a one singular river system. If you take about even Brahmaputra, I'm not even talking about Mekong or Selwyn, Yellow, Yangtze and all that. At some scale, you have to address the entire Tibetan River, but that's the headwater of Asia. And uh, enter freshwater headwater of Asia decides the fate of Asia, the millions of population downstream. So these rivers need to be taken as a common heritage. It has to be looked into a very, very holistically, and it has to be treated at a large basin scale. Many of the understandings are already there at different level. You see a river become very, very young and energetic at the early level which is also transcending to their floodplain, maybe in the India. But when it reaches Bangladesh, it's a very old, tranquil river. So sometimes the, the management of the river at Bangladesh is somewhat, I think, a lesser challenging. I'm not saying no, not challenging, but um, handling the same river upstream, you know, many of the uh, technology and solutions that Bangladesh is trying may not be as effective. So you need a, a you know, kind of a, more uh, insight into some of the processes and stuff like that. So there is clearly a transboundary common ground, uh, which is very, very clearly established with some people who can appreciate that, but it's still to kind of pervade into all levels. There are clear trade-offs, there are clear, you know, um, kind of the, sometimes it's an issue of lesser devil, uh, but uh, I personally feel that the sediment problem and the overall flood problem is solvable. Uh, if it is handled at that scale, uh, basin scale, a uh, lot of IT technologies and uh, future uh, possibilities actually anchor on uh, application of many of these newer concepts coming uh, with you know our uh, low flying aircraft, drone technology, satellite technologies, the processes over large time frame, and then you know anticipate the changes in the coming couple of years and accordingly prepare the solutions you have to keep responding quickly to the changing situation, maybe at a micro scale by bioengineering at a mega scale by some of the larger structure which are movable. If you have a lot of static structures placed for one solution, in five, 10 years time, they become redundant and they rather become a part of the problem not the solution. This is dawning upon a lot of people who are actually managing shows, the departments, handicapped. They, they have their bread and butter coming out of what they're doing conventionally they cannot change overnight to something new. And to bring something new, then to make people understand, then to make the people clean up, uh, you know, the contractors to appreciate, and then put their labor force into the new technology. It's like a long drawn process. The only solution could be that we have to, you know, start a parallel process of transboundary and collective, you know, knowledge sharing exercise, which can actually work together and at some point of time, take over the conventional process into a better solution. This can happen. Uh, PROSA is one example, others are involved. I'm sure uh, in due course, uh, the knowledge part, the, the, the realization, the wisdom, the pragmatism part has already dawned upon. But uh, the application part, uh, for various reasons, including the ministries of you know, multiple countries, uh, political issues are of course there. Uh, it, 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 there, there are bottlenecks, there are, there are convergence issues. But uh, I think these discourses are, that, that's why very important to look at alternatives and to look at also that supplementary community engagement and smaller solution, which can fit into the bigger solution and make the overall solution more robust. 
I'm still talking in the broad scale, but that's what sort of the, you know, the philosophical part of the science behind it and then how to build technology around that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahanta. Um, transboundary knowledge sharing is indeed, I think, the key to resolving this um, complex issue. Um, just before we wrap up, one final uh, question on what you think the journalists should be focusing on, what issues around river erosions are underreported and uh, journalists should write more about it. Um, and we have uh, the panelists to um, talk about this, but in like a sentence to give us some tips on what you think journalists uh, should be covering. Um, should we start with Dr. Uh, Mahata and then we go on to the rest of the panelists? Should I comment on that? Sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I guess there are, you know, many reporting potential, which uh, I'm sure today journalists are no longer the same. They are also going to the science behind processes and making more articulate reporting. Uh, this exercise itself is a proof of that. See, I didn't touch upon, for example, this whole issue of the, um, Brahmaputra is contributing about 600 million tons of sediment. And Bangladesh is adding up and finally to a Bay of Bengal uh, from uh, the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna system, about one to 1.5 billion tons of sediment going there. Now there's a huge silica content in this and the silica content is roughly about uh, say 35 to 40%. Now that makes that every year about 300 to 350 million tons of silica is going to the Bay of Bengal. The silica is a very good raw material for uh, ceramic tile industry and glass industry. The only problem is that the Brahmaputra sediment is only about 30% silica, but to make it amenable for glass and ceramic industry, you have to push to about 90% and silica. That, you know, the technology if it becomes affordable, suddenly this whole waste material creating a lot of problem uh, becomes a resource there. And then accordingly, a lot of industries can evolve around that. So what I'm trying to point out, there are a lot of unseen, a lot of uncharted areas around the erosion issue, the sediment issue, which perhaps many of our journalist friends can uh, engage into and make a very interesting story to at least to first draw attention of the viewers, the readers, and then build on that uh, other problems and that how solving uh, this uh, sediment and erosion problem can lead to a lot of other spin-off benefits. I think the human story is very important and bringing a human dimension and societal, you know, beneficial uh, dimension to the reporting can make it a more interesting engagement than simply reporting disaster. Because people are, as of today, in terms of the pandemic, are so tired of, so exhausted, so fatigued of you know, negative news, they may not be even liking to hear about another negative disaster. But probably one can bring in you know, human dimensions and other interesting dimensions that how, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Modi recently, three or four days back in my institute convention said that even uh, there may be opportunity uh, hidden even in a disaster. At least on that line, I, I support him that, that you know, but there, are, there are ways of looking at things uh, from many multiple perspectives and it need not be always what you really see up front, you know. So uh, my request to his colleagues will be to kind of, you know, go one step further, dig a little more and create a, something of a very interesting uh, uh, staff to kind of unravel uh, uh, sort of a little bit of a mystery somewhere, which makes, uh, you know, uh, draw attention of policymakers to uh, engineers, to the local uh, villagers, to make them a little more involved with the problem. Thank you. Dr. Mansoor, one tip from you, please. Yeah. You'd like so, to share yeah, your thoughts? Yeah. 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 So one thing is, uh, from my understanding and learning in Bangladesh, uh, the journalists usually uh, try to address the problem in a way that this problem uh, is, uh, is, it can be uh, solved, but it is not being solved by the individual or related authority, something like that. So the problem is there. So immediately they need the kind of solution in, in, in uh, the alignment of the local demand. So uh, I, I often talk with the journalist here and uh, also started writing a number of articles for the uh, newspapers. That is, uh, 
the journalist should know the underlying processes as well in a very plain language so that they can convey this thing with the local community as well as the policy makers otherwise the science will remain uh, in the self and it will never uh, see the light so i think learning uh, learning the journalist and and from the journalist side learning the science is is need to be have a good bridging otherwise there will always a gap so uh, we need to explain our understanding through the plain language of the journalist journalists need to understand our things and that's that that should be the way uh, through which the true science true facts will be conveyed to the policy makers and the community level and then the so the the problems can be uh, can have good solution in a sustained way so this is my message to the journalists thank you thank you dr mansour uh, navin do you want to add to that all right just super quickly you see i mean uh, uh, all these points are well taken and that's i think they're quite valid uh, what i also uh, tend to you know think and and tell people is that you know apart from even based stories even based you know when things happen then that's when we cover things right but i think there are stories which are issue based i think journalists will have to go for issue based stories events do happen and we report them and then they are soon forgotten and then the question remains did that actually address the underlying cause did it actually address the problem did we come out with any solution so i think um, if we identify the issues then you know events might serve as pegs but when something is happening and with that as a peg if we come out with issues then in that i would like to reinforce my presentation so the bigger picture you know what is the bigger picture what's the context and the science the regional thing whatever is happening i think all those all those things uh, uh will will really help uh, just to give you one example tip off uh, when we're talking about this this issue of river uh, erosion and and science and all these things uh, one one repository of story would be uh what's happening in terms of the green climate fund that's supposed to be the biggest financer biggest climate change financing in the world has it been doing anything in this issue or you know when you when you find out when you try to find out because i've been hearing about some of the projects that are being aimed at some basins but then you know what are those issues what 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 are those things that are being addressed and will they actually help people just to give an idea see so i think yes issue based out out stress on issue based stories thank you thank you navin and at you want to have some last oh, words I Yeah, just briefly. I I mean, for me, um, this this issue of displacement is um, is really interesting and, and and essential, and and stands to become one of the ma major stories uh, of the 21st century. Is um, you know the impacts of climate change, sea level rise, and um, you know bigger, fiercer storms, fires in California, et cetera, b become more prevalent. And um, I think it, it's it's essential, you know, to connect to the you know. those stories now um well we still have a chance of of um impacting the trajectory of of the earth's climate and um so i i i personally i like coming to this relatively newly um i'm fascinated about you know the, how these communities uh, grow up on the chars and um and and then move and displace um so it's something i i would like to understand more about and and sort of what the the future looks like for um people living in these sort of vulnerable low lying areas thank you thank you at and to all our speakers today and thank you to all the participants for the many interesting questions um if we haven't managed to answer all your questions um there will be a recording of this webinar that will be posted and we will be writing you an email with some of the resources that are Uh, speakers today have shared and their um, contacts so you can always uh, follow up with our speakers if you would want to um, have a further chat with them um we would like to get your feedback on this webinar um if you see on the chat there's the link to the online feedback form we would very much appreciate you to help us uh, fill in this form and let us know how you think about the webinar and give us some suggestions um so we can produce better webinars and other activities in the future um we may also do more activities around river bank erosion so it will be very useful to hear from you what you think be useful um thank you again we will be having more webinars coming up 
and we'll post them uh, on our website. So please keep a lookout. Thank you once again, and we hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.